Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you seem really far away at the back. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, I work for the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Um, is anyone here a fellow? Oh, yeah, that's a good, good number. Oh, wow. Um, you're all my bosses, then, effectively. Um, I hope I do okay. Um, for those of you who aren't uh, fellows, please do consider um, joining us. We promote research into Scotland's past, we fund research, and indeed we, um, we funded through the Buckingham Fund um, Alison Sheridan's talk um, earlier on um, uh, today. And also, although I was quite shocked by, um, by Joe's talk, um, you can join if you're a woman. I'm glad that, that that's, uh, well, that's changed. Um, I want to get onto the, I suppose I work in a society, my big hat is Dig It 2015. Um, but before going on to that, I want to talk to you just for a few moments about my smaller hat, um, or scarf, uh, research framework, my first love, um, if you like. Um, scarf was a Scottish archaeological research framework. Um, here's a slide to prove that it exists. For those of you who are involved with the creation of this resource, it was something of a Herculean um, effort. Um, over 320 archaeologists, scientists, and historians basically came together to set out what we think we know about the past and what we'd like to know um, in the future. It's partly a resource map and it's partly a, um, a resource um, trajectory. Um, it's organized by period, it looks at um, themes like science and Scottish archaeology um, and marine and maritime archaeology. And interestingly, because it's a web resource and designed to be updated, we can actually track and monitor, and um, well not monitor, we can track people um, who come and look at um, Scottish research topics. Since its launch in January 2013, we have had 44,450 users looking at 188,380 pages of information. And what's really interesting, or I find really interesting, is where people come from when they look at SCARF. This is a, um, a map of the world, obviously, and all of those countries in blue represent countries where multiple people have come um, and had a look at SCARF. Um, can I immediately, though, ask for a plea? If anybody knows anyone from Greenland, <laughs> can you ask them to look at SCARF? Because every time I look at this map, that huge expanse always upsets me. Um, I think the first thing we need to take away from this, the 144 countries where you have multiple people accessing SCARF, is that there's a huge interest in Scottish archaeology around the world. I think that's something to be proud of. Um, and that interest comes from surprising places as well. Um, apart from the, the UK and the USA, um, would anyone like to hazard a guess as to the other three countries um, in the top five looking at SCARF? Australia. Okay, okay, maybe not that surprising then. Okay, Australia, that's one. Canada, Canada that's two. Yeah. No? China. Um, India. I thought it was quite interesting. And there are a few more surprising. The Philippines is in the top 10 as well. Hundreds of people look at uh, research topics in Scottish archaeology from the Philippines. Um, why? I have no idea. And ideas would be welcome. Um, but the, this can then raises a kind of question. Um, can we understand and um, uh, build on this? Um, it reminded me a bit of Edwina's talk talking about getting the email from someone from Singapore saying, can you help me with this? There's an interest out there that, that we can perhaps um, better understand and build on. And I think that one of the reasons why people come to SCARF and, and people are interested in Scottish um, archaeology is that we can use Scottish evidence to answer much bigger, broader um, research questions. And I thought that was quite neatly um, highlighted by um, Alison right at the beginning when she was talking about Projet Jad. Um, and actually looking at material culture kind of moving um, throughout uh, Europe. So, what is the future of SCARF? Looking back on SCARF, we had a lot of success. We involved lots of people, we gave a sense of ownership, and we, we feed SCARF feeds into project design, research proposals, CPD strategies, post-excavation design, and we've had spin-offs and we've had impact. Looking at the weakness, SCARF is, is consumed um, rather than added to. It's not the ongoing process of recreation that we'd hoped when we set this up um, as, a, as a wiki. We haven't articulated fully yet with the public, um, and we're not part of routine practice um, on, on a daily um, level. Um, and there's less ownership beyond the people who created SCARF. 
and uh, people who are interested in archaeology, and um, they'll look at, at all of the information here, but they won't um, add to it. And I think that the future of SCARF and the future of research frameworks in general will be that those weaknesses need to be turned into um, strengths. We need to get more people to feed into the research process. And we're, we're starting to see more, um, more localized um, research frameworks popping up. Here's one from the Northeast. And that might be an easier way to get people to be able to feed in their information um, into the, that kind of wider body of, um, of understanding. Um, and we're also getting a bit of interest from, the, from other sectors in the research framework type of approach. Architects, um, uh, people from the built environment, people from history are looking at this type um, of way of doing things, of getting people together um, to think strategically um, about uh, uh, research. Um, and as I hinted at, we're looking at international um, interest in the, the previous slide. Um, we can use Scottish evidence to look at much more broader um, questions um, and can encourage people to come and research in Scotland, whether that's physically or digitally. And these types of questions they can look at are really big questions. Um, these things look at um, uh, a, a very good one, for example, using Scottish evidence, would be people's response to a changing environment. We've got amazing data sets for that. And Scotland is effectively um, in a, a, a barometer, if you like, for climactic systems um, for the whole of the, um, the west of Europe. We've got long chronologically controlled data sets, such as at Udl um, in the Western Isles. Um, and we can look at the final frontier in terms of the adoption of a Neolithic way of life. In fact, we've been having meetings about that um, uh, uh, very recently. And a lot of the questions that Alison in her initial talk um, outlined, um, or indeed um, Mel did when she asked pit, pot, or kissed, you know, these are questions that have a, a wider currency that more people um, are interested in, attitudes to death, how we cope with a, um, a changing environment, etc. And I also feel that I can't speak at a TAFAC conference with Derek Hall in the audience without mentioning medieval pottery and its importance. I remember um, uh, meeting Derek very, for, must have been for the first time, uh, through SCARF and being told that we needed better, more linked databases of medieval pottery. And when I asked rather naively, why on earth would we need that? Um, we then went on a very long, exciting um, journey um, that, that took us from the Baltic through the rest of Europe, up through England, Scotland, to um, Scandinavia, and how effectively the modern concept of Scotland was built through this huge trade um, uh, network. And of course, that this can be set out and charted by the tracer die of medieval pottery. And I think that one of the advantages of a scarf type of approach is we can capture that enthusiasm, we can capture the why we need to do stuff, um, and that helps us to sell it to um, people who have the funding. Um, I think one of the things that we desperately need to continue to do in SCARF and um, through archaeology generally is to feed into um, education, both formal and informal, at a young level, but also in terms of um, adult lifelong learning. And that's something I want to come back to, and it's something that um, a framework should be able to help with. I think we need to think about different audiences for our work and put them centre stage. After we created SCARF, we got a, a writer and a comic book artist um, to go through it and pull out some of the things they found interesting. And um, it, the result was this, telling Scott's story. This was the thing that made the impact. This was the thing um, that was um, launched on the day. This was the thing um, that got um, uh, 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 journalist, journalistic interest, including the, um, the BBC. And I have a, a new development to tell you about as well, um, a very new fact. Uh, we have created a directory of archaeological scientists um, on, the, um, on the website. Um, this was a, a staff panel recommendation from the science panel, um, and it's effectively a, a portal, an online portal, where people who are interested and have the skills to work with Scottish material um, using scientific techniques um, can put up their, um, their skills and their details, so that if anyone needs those skills, um, they can easily find them. And in the long term, this will also help us map skills and see where um, we have gaps. And of course, coming back to the research, the fun bits, the finding out about the past, um, SCARF is um, sparking an awful lot of spin-offs. One of them is looking at the, the River Clyde from source um, to sea. Um, and it, it reminded me actually, um, I think it's a very interesting approach, um, taking rather than the kind of the traditional regional um, uh, uh, look at archaeological material, actually taking something a bit different, um, like a, a river, as the basis of your um, uh, study. 
And in the in Scar, the T, for example, is described as the umbilical cord of medieval Scotland. And I think that um, I remember uh, um, at an ARP meeting um, earlier, Tom Rees, I don't know, some of you will probably know him, um, was talking about the uh, development that will be happening, um, particularly in, in Tayside. There seems to be a lot of that coming down the pipeline. And that seems to be as though there will be an awful lot of opportunity to really explore some of these high-level um, questions in this area. So, uh, archaeology does have challenges ahead, but we've also got a lot, of, a lot to be proud of. We've got lots of long traditions of research, including societies like TAPAC and the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. We're world leaders in things like uh, visualization. And we have emerging topics like bioarchaeology and underwater, and underwater archaeology. We've got amazing sites, and we've got international interest, um, and the list could go on. But the second half of my talk is all about promoting uh, that next year. And at this point, I promised Liz Tomms that I would do something with striptease. <laughs> That, thank you. Right, um, I thought that was going to be one round of applause from the back. Um, I promise not to take anything else off. Um, hopefully, you'll be seeing these pink t shirts. <laughs> um, hopefully, we'll be seeing um, these pink t shirts. You'll be seeing these pink t shirts throughout Scotland um, next year. What our plan is is to pour all of the exciting stuff that's happening throughout Scotland next year into one big exciting programme. We can use that to raise the profile and generate some momentum. Now to that exciting pro uh, programme, we're also adding a whole bunch of stuff that's only happening in 2015. Um, and a good example of that is the EAA, the European Association of Archaeologists Conference, that's happening. It's being held for the first time in Scotland in Glasgow. You'll have over 2,000 archaeologists um, hitting the streets, along with an entire um, festival fringe uh, based around the conference. And if that wasn't enough, we're also working with a whole range of organisations that we don't normally work with to do some, something really kind of interesting and different, taking a, um, a sideways glance, if you like, at archaeology to enrich that programme, and more about that in just a second. I think that just listing all of the things that happen um, uh, each year by organisations like yourselves, and um, from community groups all the way up to um, government agencies, really gets at the huge amount of stuff um, that actually happens each year. Um, just by listing them, we'll probably have over 350 events um, in 2015. We're taking a very broad view of what constitutes archaeology, and we're also finding that a lot of organisations are doing archaeological work or um, archaeology-related um, events, even though they don't know it. And I'm thinking particularly here of ranger services, of park services, of building preservation trusts. Now, the overarching theme for DIGIT is identities particularly local identities and that sense of connection um, of people to place. We wanted an encompassing theme, but we also wanted one that was quite challenging, and also one that archaeology has a particular thing to say. Um, an interesting element of identities that we've been looking at recently is language, and looking at the archaeology of language, and we've just put together a resource that looks at Scots language, and how you might actually address that through um, archaeology primarily through, through place names, um, and we've, we've created a, a little research project for um, schools that looks at surnames, place names, um, and a whole range of other resources, and we hope to develop that through the year. All of our stuff goes up on our website, um, www.digit2015.com. Please do and have a look. It's a fun landscape that changes over time. It's got lots of bits and pieces um, uh, hidden away. We launched it in uh, Rook and Glen Park, in East Renfrewshire last year. Now I saw, was there a store, store holder from um, Renfrewshire in the... Yeah, yeah. 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 alright, yeah. Rookenden Park is an awesome place. It's a, um, a time capsule for an entire community, um, and they've got tons of stuff going on, uh, on in 2015. I definitely recommend um, a visit. And we've got resources galore up on our website. Um, we've got uh, resources um, both for um, schools as well as um, uh, uh, archaeologists generally, um, and we link to other people's resources. This is um, the wonderful um, Wolf Brothers Wildwoods put together by the Forestry Commission. So do keep an eye on our resources section um, as the year uh, progresses. We've got two target audiences, 16 to 24 year olds and adult lifelong learners, and one of our key roles is ensuring that we've got both resources and events and um, to appeal to both. One legacy of Digit is that we really want archaeology to filter in um, much more um, into education. And as well as all of 
this educational stuff, and we'll also be promoting all of the traditional um, uh, built and braces opportunities for things like excavation um, and survey. Um, and I just wanted to put up one of my favourite slides. We were up in Orkney um, over the summer, and Orkney popped up a lot, particularly in, um, in Alison's talk. Um, if you've not had the chance to go and see the Nessa Brodsker um, excavations, they are incredible. They're completely uh, rewriting our understanding um, of the Neolithic. And again, we'll probably have to um, revisit SCARF um, as a result. As well as the, that overarching theme of identities, um, we also have um, five smaller themes in which the group um, activities around. Um, the first is arrivals of people, of ideas, um, and there are lots of interesting themes kind of emerging out of that, including the arrival um, of the Norse, and the arrival of the, the Jacobites, and there's a, an awful lot of um, uh, anniversaries in 2015. Um, and the Romans um, really is emerging as a, a strong theme, and particularly in this area, we have an awesome new exhibition coming to the air uh, at McManus, um, Roman Empire, Power and People, um, and which will involve over 160 artifacts coming up from the, uh, uh, the British um, Museum. And there are lots of events going on around the country that kind of bounce off these types of, um, of themes. And of course, there are lots of opportunities to explore what the locals were up to um, at a similar time. Um, Hillforts is a, a kind of another emerging uh, theme. And um, up at Aberdeen University, they'll have a, a Northern Picts um, exhibition. The second thing, after arrivals, is the recent past. Um, we're trying to look at the role that archaeology plays in understanding the more recent past. And um, there are lots of there's lots of stuff in this theme, including hopefully, fingers crossed, the inscription um, of the fourth bridge as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I put the slide up, obviously, just in case you've forgotten what the fourth bridge looks like. But I would recommend you go to the inscription website because there are an awful lot of really interesting um, uh, resources behind that. As well as arrivals, as well as the recent past, we have future, looking at the future of archaeology um, in terms of technology, but also in terms of archaeology's uh, sustainability. Watch out for the Society Rhymes lectures um, this year, and if you're not a fellow, you can attend them entirely for free. They're going to be very different. Um, we're also putting together a program of careers fairs um, at universities and other organisations around the country. Um, and it's interesting the emerging trends of technology that are um, bubbling up. Visualisation um, is one, and it's handy to be standing next to such an awesome um, example of that. Um, and I thought I'd put up another example that you've already seen, uh, Weems Caves um, 4D website, which is just um, awesome. I was at uh, Weems Caves um, uh, last year, earlier this year. Um, it really is uh, an, an, an amazing place. But it's also that the skills, and as, um, as you were saying earlier on, actually, you know, people can use RTI photography, everyone can get involved. I thought, I better put up the, the new SWAX website as well as the, the Weems 4D one. Um, another thing that's popped up that we didn't really expect um, is skills, both traditional and, um, and those kind of high-tech skills, particularly computer game design um, and computer-based learning is something that we've been speaking to an awful lot um, of organisations um, around. And again, we've got good examples here. And there'll be a joint lecture at the National Museum um, early next year um, held with the National Museum and us as the society, um, based around their new uh, Games Masters um, exhibition. Um, it's going to be fun, it's going to be quite unusual, um, but again, something else to look out for. Fourthly, um, our fourth theme is festival. Does anybody like whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. Um, if so, 2015 will be the year for you. Um, as well as it being an official government-led year of food and drink, um, we've got lots um, in the pipeline of working with whiskey organisations, including a project um, called Still that we're working with um, along with an artistic um, uh, director. Um, this is a, a project that he um, did this year um, with the Commonwealth Games and the Year of Homecoming uh, called Strulik. And there's a very interesting website called Strulik Stories that looks at stories of the, um, the Scottish diaspora to kind of pack this up. But we're going to be looking at um, something quite unusual called Still, which will be taking people out in dark landscapes to look at um, illicit whiskey uh, distilling. Um, I should say we're not actually illicit whiskey uh, distilling, <laughs> it's being recorded, um, but more about that um, to follow soon. Um, the festival element really looks to celebrate the past and how we reach it through archaeology. So hopefully we'll start to see archaeology popping up in a whole range of different festivals from science festivals uh, to music festivals, um, as well as um, old favourites, and particularly in this area, uh, Perth and Kinross Archaeology Month. Um, and I, I'm a huge fan of this picture. I don't know if the, on the off chance anyone in the room took it. I think it's a brilliant picture. And things like um, Scottish Archaeology Month. 
Um, and fifthly and finally, um, our fifth theme is storytelling. And we'll be in the International Storytelling Festival. Um, and I think, though, that storytelling gets at the ethos behind um, Dig It 2015. We want to get people involved in telling and enjoying uh, their story. We want to look at how we communicate archaeology. Um, and I like to think of archaeologists as storytellers. Um, or scientist storytellers. We've got lots of great data from which to tell new stories, and many of which you've been hearing about um, today. Um, Archaeology Scotland and the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland are the organisations that coordinate to get, but we've got an awful lot of partner organisations who I think would buy into that um, uh, storytelling ethos. Um, and the sheer number of organisations um, that have been involved, over a hundred, um, from local groups to government agencies, um, kind of really does highlight the, the interest and the enthusiasm um, across the country for archaeology. However, we're greedy and we're keen for more, so please get involved. Um, let us know what you're doing. We can perhaps help um, promote it. If you've got an idea for something that you'd like to do, drop us a line and we can see if we can help you develop the idea. And if you're on the lookout for something um, to help with, we can put you in touch with organisations um, that are looking for um, helpers and volunteers. Please do, if you get a chance, um, sign up for our e-newsletter um, on the website. Follow us on social media and um, uh, look at the resources up on that website for a bit of inspiration and ideas. And we also have a, um, a Get Involved page if you want to tell us a bit more about what you'd like to do. Uh, keep an eye out for the, the Dig It leaflet and our digital programme. The website will be flipping um, to a, um, a very shiny uh, digital programme which you can search and find out what you might um, where, uh, want to go to. And that will be coming your way in January. But I wanted to finish um, on that international interest again. And um, Here's a, a picture of a Dig It t-shirt modelled by a member of the Dortse tribe in southwest Ethiopia. It took us a while to figure how exactly it got out there. Um, <laughs> But I think um, whilst both Scarf and Diggit notionally focus on um, the modern country that's Scotland, there's a much wider um, community of interest um, out uh, beyond these shores. Thank you very much.